my name is Becky Senf. I'm Norton Family Curator here at the Center for Creative Photography. It's a joint appointment with Phoenix Art Museum. Before we get started, I'd like to encourage you to silence your cell phones if you have not done so already. I'd also like to let you know about some upcoming programs. On Tuesday, April 15th at 5.30 p.m., Rebecca Nijowski will speak about her work in a talk entitled Desert Pictures. On Tuesday, April 22nd at 5.30, Sama al Shaibi will give a presentation entitled Sand Brushes In about desert, the border, and the body in her work. Thursday, May 1st at 5.30, Rosalind Solomon will present Jumping Off Place, How My Life Imitates My Work. Tonight is my great pleasure to introduce Kate Palmer Albers, who will in turn introduce Pel Penelope Umbrico and will lead what is sure to be a very lively conversation. Kate Albers is assistant professor in the art history division at University of Arizona, and her specialty is the history and theory of photography. Her research has explored the relationship between photography, memory, and history, and another of Dr. Albers' persistent research interests is photography and volume. She recently published an article on the topic, Abundant Images and the Collective Sublime, in the Society for Photographic Education's Fall 2013 issue of their journal, Exposure. Please join me in welcoming Kate Palmer Albers. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. And um, I want to say thank you also to the Center for Creative Photography for hosting this conversation. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Penelope Ambrico this evening. I've been aware of her work for some time, but it made um, an especially big impression on me in 2009 when I saw her sons from Flickr installed at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. My husband subsequently had a photograph of that installation as the home screen on his cell phone for at least a few years after that, so I had ample opportunity to see firsthand the ease with which this collection of other people's sunset pictures traveled and became reinserted back into daily life. It's been a treat to do some writing about her work, and I'm delighted she was able to make the trip to Tucson. Penelope Ambrico graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto and received her MFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York. Over the past two decades, she has shown her work widely, including just in the past few years, in the exhibition One Hour Photo at the American University Museum, at the Aperture Foundation Gallery in New York, the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, the Photographer's Gallery in London, and the recent exhibit Drone, the Automated Image at La Moire de Photo in Montreal. Her monograph, Penelope Ambrico Photographs, was published by Aperture in 2011, and um, this is um, a copy of it here, and I just wanted to mention there are copies um, available for sale in the lobby, and um, Penelope would be happy to sign them afterwards um, if you buy one of those here. Uh, and she has upcoming solo exhibitions at the Milwaukee Art Museum and the Aldrich is it the Art Gallery, Aldrich Art Gallery, Aldrich Art Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she has received numerous grants in support of her work, including uh, the John Gutmann um, Photograph Fellowship, the, uh, a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and an Aaron Siskin Foundation Individual Photographers Fellowship, among many others. Her work is in, also in numerous collections. A few of them include the Guggenheim Museum, the International Center of Photography, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the San Francisco uh, Museum of Modern Art. Over the years, uh, she has looked closely at honeymoon resort brochures collected at a uh, wedding convention, pictures of mirrors and stacks of perfect books and mail order catalogs, photographs of office desks and televisions for sale on Craigslist, the latter of which were on view here at the CCP in Lyle Rexer's abstraction show a few years ago, digital images of suns uploaded to Flickr, and recently the mountains photographed by canonical masters of photography as well as by casual photographers in Switzerland. She tracks, categorizes, and collects the photographs we surround ourselves with but often barely notice and represents us with our cultural viewing habits. Her subject, as the title of uh, tonight's um, conversation indicates, is photography itself. Please join me in welcoming Penelope Ambrico. Thank you, Kate. And sure. thank you, uh, CCP, for inviting me also. Um, it's really great to be here. 
So the, the way that we're um, uh, going to be showing the images is a little bit of an experiment, um, anticipating that our conversation would be fluid and we wouldn't have a, an exact arc that, um, that we would follow. You'll see as the images progress that Penelope has put together uh, this, it's called a Prezi presentation. Um, and um, the, maybe you'll talk a minute about the structure of it as well, but you can see that she's created a kind of a um, visual um, uh, organization of her various bodies of work that is not, not linear, but um, sort of emerges from one series to the next. Um, but I wanted to begin, um, we are of course here at the Center for Creative Photography, uh, an institution that is indelibly associated with Ansel Adams. Um, and I, so I thought it was fit, would be fitting to begin by talking about your recent foray into landscape photography, and especially that that incorporates photographs made by canonical mm -hmm. modernist masters of the medium. Um, and this was a project that began with Aperture. Right. Um, and this is where this, this is the experiment to see if this works. And if anybody gets seasick, <laughs> let me know. Although there's not so, much we can do about it. So. Yes, so, <laughs> well we could maybe not do it quite so much. Um, let's back up here a little bit. Um, I was, uh, I had a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship at, this, at the time that Aperture asked um, 10 artists to do an intervention into um, their books for their 60th anniversary. And one thing that I noticed, um, well, I was at the Smithsonian, but I was also looking at the National Archives. And I was looking at the National Archives online at one point for Ansel Adams Mountains, um, mainly because the mountain itself had become a symbol to me um, for, um, well, I was thinking about photography. And um, at the Smithsonian, I was um, photographing. So this is where the, the work is all connected. I was photographing all the mini cameras in the, the collection of the Smithsonian uh, photo department. And the curator there had brought out all these little boxes with tiny little cameras. These are mini cameras. Um, and um, so these photographs I actually took, took um, with a nice camera, um, and just looking straight down at the boxes. And then I put them in um, a vitrine um, so that they feel entombed. You can see these little tags on them. And um, so as I was working on this, I was also noticing that there were mountains. Ph photographers were um, photographing mountains. I was seeing mountains in galleries and mountains on magazines. There was a cover of Blind Spot magazine that had a mountain on it. And I thought, um, I came up with this theory that the more unstable photography gets, the more pictures of mountains there are. So I was looking at mountains, and um, I noticed that these are all um, scans in various ways, uh, scans of Ansel Adams mountains um, using um, equipment that the archivists at the National Archives had at their disposal when they were um, making these mountains accessible. And I think you came to the studio then and you said, isn't that interesting? You, you're the one who actually put this into my head. <laughs> that, um, that the archivists were doing the same thing with Ansel Adams Mountains as Ansel Adams, no, with Ansel Adams photographs as Adams was doing with the mountains. In that they were making them accessible. They were making them accessible by the, the, the best means they had. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see that in here. Yeah, I guess you can a little bit. So some of these are really, you know, this is like a copy stand image of a, of a print, I think, with a scratch in it. Or maybe it's a negative. Um, this is a very low res digital scan. There are some images that like this feels like it was taken out of a book or a very curled paper or something. So you can see space between the record, between the image that's being, or the, the picture that's being recorded. There's space between that and the camera that's recording it. But then in some of them, there's no space. Like I feel like this might be a high res scan. Um, so within all of these multiple kinds of reproductions of the mountains, you're recognizing the various sort of um, modes of reproduction right, right. In, the, in the effort to distribute and make accessible right. these mountains. Right. And so I was thinking about that with these cameras. And, um, and that led me to think about the master photographer. And um, I did a little bit of research on the idea of the master. So I wrote this little piece. Um, but it really sort of came down to the idea of um, 
the male head of a household or a master um, artist, someone who holds high rank, and then an original movie or recording or document from which copies can be made. And I, I really liked that, uh, that schism. And then mountains, which are these things, but they're also um, a large surplus or a commodity. And then ranger, who, you know, if Ansel Adams was, uh, or if these, if these photographers were um, roaming the mountains to take pictures of mountains, they were rangers. And so I looked up ranger, mm -hmm. and it said also, see, rain, I looked up range and for mountains, but then also ranger. Um, but I liked that the definition of range was like the series of mountains, but also, um, you know, the distance between a camera and the subject to be photographed. And then a ranger is a person who wanders the, ra the ranges. And then also, this is just, I loved this, um, a series of nine American moon probes launched between 1961 and 65, the last three of which took many pictures of, of, that is yeah, remarkable. of yeah. the, uh, the moon and then crashed to the moon. So, yeah. So I decided to um, just look at the Masters of Photography series and then rephotograph all the mountains with as many camera apps as I could download on my iPhone. And so, um, and these are apps that you're finding in, in all, you know, all just in the app store, right? Yeah, so right, all, all right. different photography right, filters. Right. Some okay. of them are free, some of them are 99 cents. I love the ones where like people are like, you know, I read the, the re reviews of them and people don't like it because it's a great app, but it was 99 cents, it was too expensive. <laughs> like you spend $2 on your coffee every morning and you're not gonna spend 99 cents on an app. Yeah, but um, yeah, so I had something like, I don't know, 60 or 70 photo apps on my iPhone and I ended up using only about 20 of them. You have, mostly. Your, you have your favorites. I have my favorite. Yeah. So you went yeah. and you photographed, well, you're, you'll tell us. You went and you photographed the mountains, within, the, the mountains that appeared in the Aperture book. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually just, I should have like, um, yeah, so um, let's, let's see if we can go out again. OK. So I photographed the mountains that just appeared in the Aperture book, and this is sort of an example of some of the individual images from the, in, here's an example of um, a mountain range. I think this might actually be a Weston. Um, and this is the edge of the photograph, and this is the page, the paper without the photograph on it. So there's a line in this. And the other thing that is kind of great about the iPhone um, Rephotographing things as you're looking down is it has a gravity sensor in it, and um, so you know here I am looking at the, the most stable object in the world that photographers can photograph, um, and the prints of the most or not the prints the printed matter of the most stable photographers in the world, the masters, and using the least stable camera I could possibly find or the camera apps that are changing all the time with all their filters, which are ridiculous, and I have a list that I'll show you. And then the camera itself has a gravity sensor, so when I turn it in a particular way, the mountain flips. And so the stable mountain becomes this kind of disorienting, psychedelic colored thing in the end. And I, I really enjoyed this. It was also a kind of great excuse to use these apps, which I've always kind of wanted to use because they do such beautiful things. Um, but I, you know, I would never, here's some more, um, yeah. So. Well, and I have to say, one of the things that um, was so interesting visiting your studio was that you, you pulled out your phone and you, you know, sort of flipped through all of these images. And um, you know, I was sort of thinking, oh, how are you going to be able to reproduce that, that experience in an exhibition or you know, in the public? And I mean, actually, what you're doing right here is a little bit like that, the sort of scrolling through. But you do ultimately present you in, in these photographs, you did the, the um, Correspondence between a digital image that is circulating mm -hmm. in an immaterial way online and the physical uh, object that it you know may once have been was then reproduced. Then you photographed it. Right. Now it appears on a gallery. That's a tension that I think comes up very frequently in your work. Is that right. that uh, dialogue between the physical, the digital, and the, and the physical, physical? Yeah, and the singular and the multiple mm -hmm. and the yeah. Um, I thought you were referring to this because these are yeah, these were I, the vintage yeah. So these are the vintage prints. Can you see the cursor here? Yeah. Oh yeah, good. Okay. Um, the um, these are the vintage prints of um, all of the images in the books that I rephotographed, which are over here. But some of them we couldn't get because they're so rare, you know. And I, I loved that. Um, I loved the 
the uh, absolute singularity of a medium that was actually considered to be a multiple medium before we had digital photography and now is considered, it, you know, not considered but experienced as a very singular. Yeah, yeah and, well, and that's something that comes up, I think, a lot in your work as well, is this, yeah. this sort of tension between uh, the, the, the presence of something and the, and the disappearance of it, right? So right. in a way, I mean, it's not that these, it's not that those photographs have disappeared, but they were, so those are images that you weren't able to secure, they, you couldn't find them in collections or they wouldn't, that you couldn't they get wouldn't, a loan? They wouldn't let them go. They right. wouldn't, they were too rare to be brought to Aperture. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or the, you know, maybe the insurance was too expensive and they couldn't do it, but there was only this one that they could find that, um, and they wouldn't allow it to be in the show. Um, so these were the, these place markers. But I also think that there's something interesting about this and being here today, too, that um, on the contrary to, like, the singularity of these editions, which are so precious, and, you know, maybe there were five printed or 20 printed, and, well, maybe even... You know, I, there was an edition, and the edition had to be all the same. Um, I just love today. I was in the, um, the I was looking at Ansel Adams' prints, and um, just this idea of using, allowing his work to be kind of used as a teaching medium, and and that there were so many variations of all the prints, and um, in, in some ways he seems like a visionary. In you know, and I just discovered that. Um, I was told by Leslie that he had um, all these letters that he'd write. He'd like write eight, eight letters a day to somebody. You know, it's like he's like a modern day tweeter. You know, like um, sort of but with a typewriter. Desire to you know, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, really great. But yeah. Um, so let's actually back up a little bit. So this is some of the more recent work you've looked at, and um, go back to the <laughs> Suns piece, which um, is I. I think the work that you're the most, that you've gotten the most recognition mm -hmm. for. Um, and this is a piece that is, is very different, I think, from the, the Aperture Masters of Photography work because it, the source material is not, you know, sort of famous canonical photographs, but instead it's... Um, the exact well, opposite, Well, really. I mean, mostly the exact opposite, yeah. but material that is sourced from Flickr and um, that comes, oh, I haven't seen that one. <laughs> well, this <laughs> is material that yeah. comes from Flickr and could be made by a professional photographer, or could be made by just you know, sort of um, casual, everyday photographer, um, but, is, but has been uploaded onto Flickr. So do you want to talk about the sort of genesis of this project um, or something well, else about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that in opposition to, to the CCP and really like Adams and the Masters of Photography and um, well, the Aperture's Masters of Photography and the Mountain. Um, what I'm most interested in with the Sun is that it, it's it's actually there is a kind of stability about it, but it's always moving and it's the singular object and um, um, it uh, is always photo. We've we've worshipped the Sun since we've had you know since we've known about cult. You know, since we've had since, yeah since consciousness yeah, um, and so um, the the um, the participation or the you know the act of taking a photograph of a sunset is actually a participatory act. Nobody takes a sunset in order to make a photograph that doesn't look like a sunset, like the typical sunset. When you take a, a photograph of a sunset, you're actually interested in participating in, or you're not maybe interested in it, but you in fact are participating in the whole history of sunset photographs and. A sunset photograph that doesn't look like a sunset photograph would not be the one that you would share with your, you know, you're there with your romantic lover on the beach and there's a beautiful sunset and you, you wouldn't take a picture that the sunset is like, you know, black and looks like a bloody, you know, whatever or something, you know, it would have to be this romantic sunset that really, you know, um, this would be the sunset and, oh, it's a little, it's getting too big there, it's getting out of focus, but, um, so I was interested in the script of that kind of a photograph and um, the ritual of it, right? yeah, the co right. sort of collective ritual of but it really all of these pieces yeah. coming together. And it started really because I, the first time I searched in 2006 on Flickr for sunsets, there were 500,000, and it was the most tagged uh, subject on Flickr. And to me, that was kind of phenomenal that we have this one singular sun, but there would be that many of it online, which seemed like a very yeah. 
Right, and this list that you're showing now, and this is something we were um, talking about earlier today with some of the graduate students, is that the 500,000, you know, the, the sort of relative volume, right, 500,000 now seems like almost nothing. Right. right. I mean, when you're comparing it to 13 million, and you said it's, it's, it's more than 16 now, million, yeah. And yeah. There's a certain point at which you just sort of shrug. Yeah, it's <laughs> oh. like, yeah, okay. it was phenomenal yeah. to me up until about 8 million, and then it just started like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. At a certain point, you've got enough. Yeah. There are, we have enough sunsets. Right. Well, and that, but the reason I think that this piece has to keep going on, like I'm going to do this forever, I guess, because um, it will get up to 32 million. You know, it'll be a, tri you know, it'll be 32 trillion at some point, and um, you know, maybe 10 years from now, or maybe two weeks from now. I don't know. You know, like it, uh, it, it should just keep going until it stops itself. Like I, yeah. So let's talk about the process of this as well, because in this case. Um, with the, the Masters of Photography work, you were photographing uh, the complete image, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, you're cropping uh, whatever the, the sort of amateur photograph was, you're cropping it down to just focus on the sun oh, itself. Actually, right? in the Masters of Photography, I was, I'm not photographing <coughs> the complete image. I'm, um, I'm, oh, well, really, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm really just taking the mountain. So mm -hmm. a, lot of them, a lot of them are kind of unrecognizable. Right. Just because I'm just taking the peak of something and there might be like a field in a house and yeah. So is there any difference for you in that working process when you know you're working with an Edward Weston or an Ansel Adams photograph versus, you know, some a, a Flickr user you've never heard of? Yeah, because this one is an absolute engagement with the idea of mastery. Like this is, um, and it actually kind of changed when I invited the public in the Swiss Alps to respond because then it became more like the sunset piece. Mm -hmm. Where, um, so I was, I'd done this project with Aperture and um, there's an installation. Um, let's see, so I'm still learning how to use this, this program a little bit. And then I did another project at Bethel University and the cur a curator of, um, of a photo festival in the Swiss Alps called um, Alt 1000. Alt 1000 asked to do asked me to do something in the Swiss Alps so I actually did a Google search of Swiss Alps um, and then I also got um, a lot of sound of music mountains which are not in the Swiss Alps but I decided you know when you do a Google search and you call it Swiss Alps and then you get sound of music then it has to be included <laughs> so I called this project moving mountains because I've called it all moving mountains or mountains moving um, because I like this kind of idea of the mountain going from one time to another um, and then um, of Swiss Alps and Sound of Music, and then we made billboards of the, of the images. So these are actually site. People look at these and think I digitally inserted these images in there, but these are actually my, my photographs of the installation in the Swiss Alps. Site-specific billboards. Site-specific billboards. Yeah. And, um, and I wanted to write an app so that people coming to this place in the Alps could take a photograph, and um, and if they took a photograph of, you know, the mountain, it would the app would have a kind of um, peak recognition and take the peak of the mountain and flip it upside down and invert the color. And I did a little research on app writing, and it was going to cost like a real lot of money. So I decided to do this public um, talk, this public um, intervention, which basically asks, it's a kind of um, uh, fictional proposal about a mountain and a smartphone trading information. And um, so I proposed to the people reading this at the site, this, this sort of lookout, that they, they think about the technology and they think about the sort of iconic mountain image that we all know, and that they make iconic image mount, Im images of the mountain without the idea of feeling like they're authoring a special, you know, their own special view of it, but with an idea of contributing to the iconic vocabulary of the mountain. And, um, and then uh, to take a picture, send it to me. At this, they gave me an email address for the um, thing. And then I would send them back a, um, my iPhone processed image. And the whole thing would take place in iPhone to iPhone or, or smartphone to, I to smartphone, really. Um, and I thought I'd get like 12 people and um, 650 people responded. So I'm still working on this. This was last June. 
So this is an example of like a screen grab of, um, like this is one screen grab. And this is what we're looking at. This is the process of you running any particular image through right. a series of apps. Right, so this is the first image here. And then I processed it and then sent them. I processed, processed it until it got to about here and this one and I thought, oh, actually, I just really like this one. <laughs> so I sent them that one, and then this one I also processed till it got to here, and I think I might have sent, I can't remember which one I sent here. Um, there's another example. There's one um, that I just did a lot of. I just didn't like any of them, and then I sort of went back and got the image again and did some more. So sometimes they took me like an hour to do, and sometimes they, they took me um, like five minutes. And then the, um, I think I have some images of, let's see, let's zoom out here a little bit. This is an example of the ones, these are what I sent back. So um, I just put these together. Um, well, and then yeah. it continues, the collaboration continues, right? So there's now an additional option for right, yeah. further. So uh, I'm asking people as they send them back if they want to be part of a print edition, they can send me a print they, they should make two prints, um, any, any size, any, uh, on any paper, glossy, mute, matte, whatever, um, any kind of print um, process, um, <laughs> and um, send me one, and then I will send them a certificate of authenticity that they have number one in an edition of two. Um, and so then I have, basically, if 650 people did that, I would have an exhibition of six hundred and fifty have a different big exhibition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, probably not. They probably won't all do it, but yeah, it would be really great. But you've gotten yeah. you've gotten some. I mean, yeah, you've I've gotten, gotten about ten or fifteen. So right. yeah, yeah. Well, and it's a funny thing because uh, you're starting off with this sort of circulating image, but then you're reducing it down to a printed edition of two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, that that again, that kind of tension is sort of built in. Right. Um, one of the things. Mm. Um, that I'm also interested in talking about. Um, you've worked for you know quite a long time with images that come from you know all kinds of sources online and, and catalogs, mail order catalogs, this kind of thing. Um, the one of the pieces that, that did show here was the Craigslist televisions, mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to hear you um, speak a little bit about um, you, the the idea of what the photograph is sort of necessarily recording and, the, and mm -hmm. the, the, the kinds of records that the photograph is making, intentionally or unintentionally. Right. Um, should I, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with this project. Um, you want to back up a little bit? Like okay. with, the, yeah. with these? Sure. Um, this was, um, it's actually, a, it was a, a standalone website at some point where um, um, I was thinking about these armoires on home improvement websites and um, how they're all so perfect. Um, and if you had an armoire like this, it probably wouldn't be, you know, like if you were interested in buying an armoire, um, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't look like this in your home. You, you, would, you would want it in order to, you know, clean up all your clutter. There'd be a lot of clutter inside it. So I, I created this website where it's no longer a standalone because I didn't pay for the registration of it. But <laughs> uh, so it's now on my website. But uh, I started with a um, Pottery Barn, I think it's the Pottery Barn armoire, and um, and then on Craigslist found as many different um, versions of it as I could. And then um, as you click through the website, you go from one to the next to the next, and they start to get more and more um, messy, messy. <laughs> and decrepit. And my idea was that if you wanted an armoire to clean up your crap, you know, you would, you might come upon this website looking for one, and then you get to this point and you go, okay, it's not really going to help. But, um, <laughs> and that's what the project really was about. But then I, but then I started to like go, like I was thinking, this is crazy. Like, um, this. Oh wait a minute, it's going the wrong way. <laughs> I want it to come this way. Um, this person who's like selling this armoire, like how is this, like you can't even see the armoire, right? And um, 
But you, what you can see is you can see these little pictures, and you can see how busy the person is, and you can see the coffee cup here, and um, there's like a person here, and in this one you can see all their clothes, and in this one there's like I guess that's like I think that's like a pinup image here. You know, you you get to see like the private lives of these people, and um, at, at this point I'm starting to think well. Actually, even though people are saying they want to sell their armoires, really what they're doing is they're trying to make a connection to an anonymous public, or they're trying to to, um, to show some kind of personal presence online. And I thought it was kind of um, like a subconscious urge for presence. And this was the one that um, really got me thinking because the, not only is the armoire kind of it's not the same armoire as the other ones, but not only is it messy and like there's whatever dirty laundry on the television, but in the television there's a flash and that flash actually is the, um, the presence of the photographer, of the seller. Like that actually indicates the, the seller there um, in that reflection. And so I, I was thinking about the reflection. I, well, I was thinking about a few things. One is um, there's, oh here, I have like all the armoires in the website here. You can see how they get messier and messier. But um, one of the things that I was thinking about was this phenomenon of um, reflecto porn. Um, I'm curious if other people have heard of it. Has like anybody heard of reflecto porn? No. no. <laughs> one. One. <laughs> um, For some remain. <laughs> so it's, uh, it was this phenomenon um, on eBay that um, people were posting um, things for sale. Oh, this on, was on eBay. This was on eBay. Okay. And um, it's called reflecto porn because people caught on to it and then I guess people have just called it that. But um, eBay had to get sensors to, to check. I think this is maybe the beginning of when they started to have people looking and making sure that they weren't like really, I don't know, hidden bad things messages, going on. secrets, yeah, right. right, as you called them. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, so in this one there's a woman here. Uh, this one doesn't seem that weird, but like this one, there's a naked person here. <laughs> and then this is a close-up of a guitar pickup, and then in the pickups there's this guy. <laughs> so, um, and I'm reminded, you know, thinking about this, there's also this Craigslist Mirrors, which I think is really a great Tumblr. It's really like... And this is not your work. This, this is, is not This my has been work. making the rounds on yeah. social media lately. This is not my work either, right? Like right. These are just things that I'm thinking about and thinking um, how similar or different. Uh, so this is Craigslist Mirrors, and this guy just has a Tumblr and is posting all the mirrors that he finds on Craigslist for sale where there's something funny going on, um, and you see the reflection of the person. But one thing that I, the reason I'm showing these is that they're inherently completely the opposite of what I'm interested in because anybody selling this mirror knows that he or she is being reflected in here. Um, the nature of the mirror is a reflective medium and um, some, sometimes they're funny but you know they don't care but they know that they're there. So mm -hmm. what I was interested in was um, this inadvertent presence like this presence um, where it's for the sale of the, maybe it's for the sale of the television, or maybe it's for the sale of the armoire, but inside this reflection is, is something. Um, so I started to collect all the, <laughs> this, is, this is a sampling of maybe, this is like 0.1% of what, I, what I've been collecting. Um, at first it was just televisions that had um, flashes in them, but um, my work is so um, dependent on the technologies that people are using so that as, as camera technology has gotten better and better, I've been able to find more and more information in these images. So I started off, this is actually... Wait, what, is, what do you mean? How is that? What's well, gotten better? Um, this iPhone has like an 8 megapixel oh, camera. Oh, I see. So it's recording more right. in the reflection. And okay. in 2008, it had you know, cell phones or the cameras were like two megapixel. So um, so this is earlier work. This may have been in the show that was here, actually, because yeah. this is the installation that was at Aperture. Um, and then, um, but now, okay, so I have this piece that I made specifically for this presentation, for this, for, this, for this program. So this is 
an image of all the TVs that I've collected so far. And um, we can go into it. And one of the things that I love about this project is that I start to feel really voyeuristic. I, I go into other people, I go into cities, and then when I'm searching on Craigslist for the TVs in cities, um, I'm basically, in, it feels like I'm being invited into people's bedrooms and living rooms to, um, you know, so in their TVs I'm finding, um, you know, things like this. This, yeah. this is a bed. There's, there's a, you know, a guy. Some of them, so these are the kinds of images I was first finding, and then I started to be able to find, um, like, images like this, you know, where you're getting a lot of detail. And I really love, I, I love the, the kind of privacy of, um, you know, this kind of privacy. There's a really phenomenal, like, uh, oh, no, no, go this way. Sorry, if anybody's getting seasick, please tell me. I have no idea what it looks like over there. <laughs> like there's some, stop, I have to stop clicking. All right, I'm trying to get to this guy with this, this messy bed and um, oh, that's the edge of this image. <laughs> Do you guys see what? <laughs> I mean, I, the the thing about the reflecto point started to become true as I've start as I've done this for so long. I'm starting to find these kinds of images, and yeah. Well, and it brings up an interesting question about intentionality, right? right. Like, to what degree are you know, you've, you, you're interested in this idea that maybe people are putting, you know, sort of subconsciously putting out an image of their private lives right. in this public realm. And I, and I think this is maybe an interesting segue into a, a sort of conversation about um, the, the nature of, of space online. And this right, is something right. that we've been talking about in um, the class that I'm doing now is how we sort of conceptualize or imagine um, the what that is when, when the online space and, and the degree of uh, publicness that it that it is and mm -hmm. um, one of the students made a comment that you know it's it's online space is public space right so it's like being a street photographer you right. know and and you can you can take anything because it's all public space right, right. like in the way that you would um, take a take a you know a be a street photographer take right. a photograph on the street right. exactly um, and so I'm curious to know in you've obviously spent a lot of time mm -hmm. um, looking at images online and going through various types of online public space um, and, I, and I actually think you do draw a distinction between more more public parts of public mm -hmm. online space mm -hmm. and more private parts right that are also public anyway could you well yeah I mean I, I think that I'm you, um, I'm interested in those spaces that people um, make public. Like, I guess I'm not, you know, we were talking about Mark Edelman's work a little bit, but, you know, but just somebody who did work um, ab about individuals and how individuals are playing, um, playing to the camera. And I guess what's interesting to me about this was, um, is um, that every single person posting a photograph here is publicly posting that photograph and it's in a public space like Craigslist, um, but it's of a private place, and um, which is very different than someone doing something private in public and then posting it into mm -hmm. a private space. Well, you know, that's or, different than sunsets as well, which right, are often, public and public yeah, community yeah. experiences. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I guess I was, you know, I was interested in this idea of almost like blow up, you know, that the movie blow up, like going in and in and in the photograph to find some evidence of something. But in this case, it's going into a kind of intimate space rather than a public space. Mm -hmm. And um, but that people are willingly putting those images on a public in a public forum. So there's no there's no issues of privacy boundaries there. And these people are all I mean, there's no um, nobody here. Well, first of all, nobody in any of these images would be recognizable because the because of what the surface of the television does so they remain anonymous and um, I guess that anonymity is something that I'm really interested in mm -hmm. um, or 
interested but also rely on in order to not feel like I'm ethically violating any rule, any rules of privacy or you know right because there's the there is that the one um, piece of the son's the son's work that um, where rec there are recognizable right. individuals right um, and and you actually even well you, do you credit them in the exhibition um, the um, photo streams that the, those images are yeah, from yeah I can't remember whether I credited them in the exhibition these um, so these are images. Well, you, you can describe it better. If you, yeah, you want me to? I, well, okay. yeah. Well, well no, okay, so it. these are images that after um, the, um, the Sun's piece is exhibited, uh, uh, people who are visiting the museum, there's a, there's a tendency to, and I can sort of vouch for this, to kind of want to like hang around in front of these installations because they're big and warm and happy and beautiful and everyone's in a good mood. And you get your picture taken in front of the, the sunsets and then people will put them back up on Flickr and Penelope finds them and uh, reprints them out and sort of uh, pulls them into her own image right. production. So this is an example of like, um, someone had asked today when I was talking about this why I, I said Steve Rudd's photo stream, which is a way of crediting the origin, the photographer who took this photograph. Um, but it was I had done it actually because I thought it was interesting that these guys also, uh, these are not Steve Rudd's photo stream. These are the result of these guys as photographs here, and um, I just like the kind of recursiveness of this this project. And I also felt like this is the one and only project that I've actually allowed people to be able to be identified because um, um, we were talking about this a little bit too but you know this is a place where they're these people are using my work as their sort of you know their their sunset so I can use their image to you know it's a documentation of my work so um, but I, I also did a been finding you know things like this so then she knows about this and she's doing this and then so I had this um, little project that I did where these are pictures of people taking pictures of my sunset my sun installations and then these are those pictures that these people took and then these and are those you, f you you just sort of I just out. found them okay. yeah I mean it was just it started with this one image of um, um, in Australia I found it on Flickr, like someone had been there and taken a picture of it and posted it on Flickr and then it's I found nice it. Installation. Yeah, it's great. Actually, I contacted him and I asked him for the large file and I would give him credit. I use it as a publicity shot and, um, it's, and he gets credit when it gets published. Um, but um, yeah, and then so these are pictures of people taking pictures of, them, of their loved ones in front of my thing and then these are those pictures that those people took and then these are pictures that people have taken of that um, and it could keep Follow going on yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway yeah right. so in terms of um, you've worked both with online archives and online archives designed as archives and then sort of inadvertent online archives but also physical archives and as far as your working process does it does it make a difference to you where the images, you know, the, the sort of degree of physicality that the images have at the start? You know, if you're looking at the, if you're at the Smithsonian, mm. looking at, pr at prints, prints or at reproductions of right. prints as physical objects right. versus... Um, well, um, I'm trying to get back to the mountains. Because mm -hmm. um, what I was going to say was that we're going through all the bodies of work here. Um, where are they? Okay. Um, that the Bethel image, so Bethel uh, University asked me to do an installation as well, and they sent me digital files of um, uh, an archive of, of travel pictures they had by George C. Poundstone, who was, um, he was um, the head of the I think he ran or he started a camera club in in St. Paul or in Milwaukee, in um, Minneapolis, and then donated all of his photographs to St. Um, to Bethel University. So I actually used these and rephotographed them on my with my iPhone on my computer. So um, I got like all these moray patterns happening, and so the moray became a part of the 
part of the um, of the project. And I liked that you know that if I didn't have access to the actual print object, if I photographed mm -hmm. it on line on the screen, then the the artifacts of the screen would show up, and so it points to the screen as being a kind of medium as opposed to paper. Does right, that, so the yeah. paper has become a screen right. medium. But you often, I mean, you don't you don't typically photograph the screen, right? You more you more typically do screen. You do um, you download images directly from online. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, this project it was the only one that I've right. Yeah, but all the rest of them. Um, are all images that I've taken from online that I've downloaded, yeah. Okay, so and so one of the things that has happened, re well, I don't know if it's that recent, but that, that there seems to be a lot of conversation about um, is uh, the, the degree to which images can kind of get away from you and the, the, the original author, you know, I think there's quite a lot of anxiety about this really um, in, in certain circles that the original authorship, the original author can, uh, can completely lose track of their photograph as it as it sort mm -hmm. of travels circulates, tra yeah. cir cir circulates and travels through online space, and I think that the I think that maybe we should look at the um, Grand Central Station mm. project as a as, as a an very um, clear example of the sort of confusion of attribution of some of these mm -hmm. images as they as they circulate online and how that you know I mean it's it's a practical problem but it's also sort of an interesting right. conceptual problem. Right. So this is. Um, I, um, this was also a kind of assignment-driven piece because I was asked by the Grand Central Terminal or the MTA to do a piece, if I could do a piece for their 100th anniversary celebration. It was for a, not a public installation. It was a public exhibition, but not a permanent installation. But I didn't want to just like, you know, do something just for the sake of doing it. And it actually took a while to come up with this. And now I'm really, I'm really happy with this piece because what it is is, um, I, you know, I realized something about train time and the sun, and I was working with the sun as a kind of subject in a way um, before. So this was this iconic image of the rays coming into the station. And I wanted to do something with it, so I tried to find, you know, who was the photographer, when was it taken, and so I did a lot of image research online and found that there were only four actual, like there were five or six different images, two of them by well-known photographers, and you could point to who the photographer was. But the most iconic ones, the ones that all the posters are made of, um, and I have five photographs here, it should be four, because I actually realized that, I thought it was five, and then I realized one of them was just highly cropped and it was the same as, but this is what I called this piece five photographs, four photographs of rays of sunlight in Grand Central Station, Grand Central Terminal, because these are all the different titles and attributions and dates. Grand Central Station, Grand Central Terminal, two, 1903 to 1913, 1920, 1926, 1928, 1929, blah, 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 blah. And then all these dates to all the different ones, like not, and then um, by all of these different people, um, and organizations, some say unknown and anonymous, and then courtesy of, and then all of these different um, um, archives and trusts, and all of which had at some point staked some sort of claim right, on right. So this what image, I, what, these images. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these images basically, um, well, this is an, that's an installation shot. Um, it's just not very well lit. All of them have things like. Picasso.com on them. They're like poster companies that are selling them. These are, this is a Google image search that I'm doing, and I'm just getting the, every time this image shows up in a Google image, in image search, I'm taking that file and putting it into this array. So um, this one I loved. I loved that it said Picasso.com right over it, and so I actually made a poster of it, I, um, a painting, a canvas. I got a canvas made. but. Um, for the sake of illustration, I've actually put together. So this is one it's of like the images. It's not. Oh, that, no, that's okay. That's okay. Right so this is one of the images. So this is the same image, cropped in different ways and also color treated in different ways. And then these are the different attribution, attributions I was able to find for this image. Here's another one. Um, one image cropped, like they sell posters this way, that this half way, the image. yeah, half the image, yeah. they color it like this, 
And then these are all the different attributions for this one image. And I, I mean, I'm assuming you're not interested in finding out sort of the, the truth, or, I did, or are I, you? I did try to find out, okay. actually, because this is also the image that the MTA has. Mo I bought a mouse pad at the MTA. <laughs> uh, the MTA, the, the, the arts, what is it, the MTA Transit Store. Okay. They have like all these um, souvenirs. And they have this on a mouse pad. I actually talked to the archivist at the at the MTA, and they don't they don't, they know. don't know. Yeah, but that's for not for this one. That's for I think it's for this one. I can't remember. Um, and then here's another one. But I love that they get flipped too. Like they, you know, people flip them. Um, right. And this one has um, well, this okay. This is the one that the transit. The, um, the New York City Transit Museum has, yeah. the, but they didn't know who actually took it. Well, why don't we um, open it up to some questions, if um, <coughs> anyone would like to ask some questions to, Pen to Penelope or um, look at some of, some of the works a little bit more. Actually, why don't, as we're sort of transitioning into that, can you talk a little bit about the, the design that you came up with in the, you know, so zoom back and, and talk about how this, oh. the process of creating this. The process of, yeah. I'm going to turn the lights up a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I discovered this program. Does anybody know the, this program called Prezi for presentation? What's it called? Prezi, P-R-Z-I. <laughs> You're all going to go in. It's, it, did it make anybody seasick or nauseous? It did? Not today, but I've seen You've Prezi. seen other ones? I've seen on Pinterest and Nausea. Not because they do all this turning thing and yeah. yeah but it hasn't, no, nobody got nauseous, I'm just curious. Okay. Um, but what I found would be really, I think it would be really good for my work. I thought it would be because, and I, I actually really enjoyed putting this together, was that um, there are these kinds of, tr you know, um, projects that, like for instance, this is this whole line here is the sun's project, which is really not about suns, but about photography. Um, but then out of that comes this other thing that we didn't talk about today, but like I could just, you know, I did this other project around copyrighted suns based on a discussion board that came out of this presentation, this, this exhibition, and that led to some other things here, and that led to this project, and then um, the Sun's projects came out of a consideration of print media and idyllic spaces that, that came from also thinking about views on the internet, views through idyllic homes. And so, you know, there's then this armoire project that led to the TV project, but it also led to the Sun's project. So then I had like this other vertical here. And this led to used objects mm -hmm. that we used to love and nobody wants anymore, and the relationship to the screen, and then screen technology, and then other technologies that led to the cameras, that led to the mountains. But then up here, there's so I have like all of these kind of horizontal it's like the and wormhole of a Google yeah, image search right. or something. So right. it's like, and it, yeah. it, it, it sort of traces how I work also. Like I'll be working on this, and then I'll be like, oh, but there's all these these um, used LCD, there's these used, these LCD TVs that people are selling that are broken and they turn them on to show that the parts work. While I'm, you know, while I'm working on, on those, well, wherever they went, yeah, these, I start to find these and yeah. So Any questions out there? David. Um, something that was, um, a uh, major strain of conversation at an event we had at the CCP a, a couple of weeks ago is sort of where the edges of photography are, sort of what constitutes photography. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how much you've dealt with that in thinking about, you know, the, the canonical, you know, stream of right. photography and sort of the way photography is conceived of within certain circles right. and, and what, your, what your practice is and sort of uh, how, what you see as your relationship to that, but also how others have um, sort of intellectualized your relationship to that. So. Right. Um, I th it's a really good question for me to answer to specifically because um, about three years ago I was in a show at, um, in Arles, in, in France, 
I'm not saying it properly. Arl. Arl. We know what you the mean. The yeah. Arl um, show. And it was, um, it was called From Here On. And it had all of these, a lot of people doing work sort of like mine. I, I think a lot of it was maybe, um, you know, within the context, everybody's work probably was a lot deeper than, than it seemed when everybody was together. But I think um, what, what that did was it galvanized for me a moment, like everybody was saying that, um, that photography is dead in a certain kind of way. The, the sort of ethos was um, there are no photographers anymore um, because you could just find photographs or whatever. And it was the first time that I actually felt like I could say I was a photographer. Like I was kind of insistent on saying I was. I, I could. Um, because, um, because it became, at, at that point anyway, in my mind, um, such a non-exclusive medium um, that um, it, it can't really exclude anybody. But also realizing that what I do online is actually equivalent to a documentary photographer. I'm documenting things that I find interesting, so when I go to a site you were asking me I have this whole I wonder if this will show if I yeah so um, I have this collection of images which I haven't done anything yet they're just a collection still of um, images of people's fingers touching hardware like um, computer hardware and I find it a really interesting phenomenon this idea of the sort of insertion of the body into the machine in this way and um, some of these are better than others but Sometimes you get like you know a finger into an actual into the body of a laptop or something that I think are taking it apart, um, and you would ask me like how do I find those you know and it's like I don't I don't just do a search on I couldn't do a search on Flickr or on Google fingers touching hardware nobody would ever tag their <laughs> their images that right um, so. <laughs> So I have to, you know, I have to look for sites that I think I might find that, and that's very much of a documentary photographer position. You're not going to go to, um, you know, you're not going to go to a pet store if you want to do a documentary project on mechanics. You know, you'll go to a mechanic, you know, it's a mechanical engineer studio, or you might go to a car, whatever. So, but that um, also gets to that back to that idea of the the public space online and the the equivalent not not to a street photographer in that instance, but responding to this world sort right. of laid out before you. I do think it's like a street photographer, though. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, like the, that the internet is a kind of street. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, not the same kind of street, but is kind of like people put things out on the street. There's public interaction, and there are things to be seen. And, yeah. 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 Comment, yeah. Specifically with that uh, show that you had on the signs, did you use copyright material? Did you use? Uh, I used everything. And but did you give them credit if you did? Well, and I mean, look at these are copyrighted, and I used these. Um, but you know, I'm calling attention to the copyright here. In in the um, in the Suns project, here's a bitter, big, bigger image of that. Um, well, for one thing, no, I didn't give credit. I used just a tiny part of the images. Let's see if we can go back to, yeah. I only used images that I felt were scripted, that I could find like just a circle of the sun in. And I, I um, took out in every instance everything but the sun. So the images that I made the size of the sun was based on the amount of atmosphere around it without having any subjective, like without having any um, land or land trees or, or buildings yeah, any or context, people. Or, yeah. right. mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I was really dealing with in this project is the idea of this collective um, practice of photographing the sunset. So even if I could have, like I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to make the project if I had had to ask permission to use people's photographs because 
I needed, you know, for instance, this one, I needed 2,500 images to fill this wall, and I just wouldn't have done it. So, um, I mean, unless I was wealthy and I could hire people to do it or something, but um, I'm, I'm not. So, but the other aspect of it is even if I could, it would have um, been counterintuitive to the project had I given attribution, because the whole point is, is about the kind of collective nature of this kind of photography. So that's what I was interested in, in talking about with that work. Yeah, but so. still, you, you right now, it's your copyright on that, correct? I mean, you talked about your I don't copyright my work. I mean, you could go and make my work if you want, but you know, it's not that interesting if someone else does it, because I did it already. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think we talked a little bit about this actually earlier. Um, the idea of like, can you take something and use it? You know, and so within the sea of all sorts of stuff, where you're not really sure where, you know, if you did a Google image search on a sun, for instance, a sunset, what you come up with is a whole lot of different kinds of images, and any one of them could be anything, right? Like, they're, um, it's not until you go into the site where it's from and try to do some research where it becomes something other than just this kind of neutral um, image. If you can take that image and work with it and use it and transform it and make it your own, then um, it's become something else. And if you can't, then that means that that image is very strongly authored by the original person. You know? So if you took... Um, I'm That's trying to think of an of interesting uh, distinction, strong authorship versus weak authorship. Yeah, right? well, and, and then there are some things the that weak, are... Yeah, really. yeah, and then there are some things that are not authored at, at all. Like, you know, you think of um, that Marilyn Monroe po portrait that we were looking at, or like Prince's... Marlboro Man, like who knows who the photograph photographer was? Who probably maybe some people do know here. Yeah, I think, <laughs> the yeah, I think that is that actually is known. Yeah, know, right. By now, right. But but, uh, um, but you know, it was the photograph itself was taken, or actually the um, the the Shepherd's Ferry and mm -hmm. Obama poster thing is a really great example because um, you know the press photographer who took the photograph of Obama was not supposed to be making an authored kind of photograph. It's a press photograph that Obama actually, you know, everybody, that, that the press card is set up in such a way to take the photograph that Obama wants to be, have taken, not what the photographer who's taking the photograph wants to author. And, um, you know, he's fairly anonymous in that situation. So, um, I mean, if anybody owns that photograph, it's the American people who, who, <laughs> who voted for Obama, not, not the, not, AP or the photographer, yeah. Interesting. But, any other oh, questions? I was just going to say to the uh, to to respond again to the idea of um, the distinctions, the edges of photography. I'm I'm curious about like whether there really ever was any kind of edge of you know like whether there's there's no like I think right now photography seems really unstable because there's so many different kinds of photographers, there's so many kinds of cameras, there's so many techniques, there's so many kinds of photographs, um, but hasn't there always been? I mean, it's just, it's never really been a very well-defined medium, which is actually what's so great about it. I mean, it's so exciting about it. It's always been able to be used, you know, in a way that no other medium has been able to be used. So, all right. Well, maybe that's a good place to end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.